Okay, that looks like everyone in. Um, so welcome everyone um, to the next um, edition of Paleo Perks and the next um, seminar within our Paleo Pathways career series that we're that we're doing over the next um, several months or so. Um, so we're really excited um, to welcome Sarah Kasovic from um, the Australian and New Zealand International Ocean Discovery Program at the Australian National University in Australia. So um, Sarah is the IDP manager that and Sarah will be presenting a talk um, called Tiny, Tiny Time Capsules um, Unveiling Ancient Worlds Through 3D Scanning of Radiolarians. So um, if this is your first Paleopex seminar um, or if you haven't been for, back for a little while, um, we'll go over a quick format of today's seminar. So we have some welcome and announcements for the next um, five minutes or so, followed by Sarah's talk, a moderated Q&A um, and an after talk tea time, which Sarah has um, very kindly agreed to stay for today. Um, we very much encourage you to stay for this as well. Um, don't forget to send your questions via the chat directly to the questions at Paleo Perks host, who today is Isaiah. Um, so um, this is our Paleo Pathways series um, schedule, um, so the first part of it. So we'll also have some seminars um, later this year in October. Um, so we are on the third one, um, which is uh, where we are with the star. And we've also got um, three more coming up. Um, in the next um, month or so. Um, so definitely remember to, to sign up um, and we hope to see you uh, within the seminars this season. Um, so a bit of housekeeping. Um, so Paleo Perks values the participation um, of everyone interested in the paleo sciences. Um, please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. If you somehow found yourself here without having signed this, please take a moment to go to our website um, and have a look at this and review it. Um, please remember to meet yourself for the duration of the talk. If you you shouldn't be able to, but if you find that you can, um, please remember not to so that we maintain a nice quiet environment for our speaker today. You can also ask questions by chatting to the questions at Paleo Perks host or by using the raise hand function um, to ask your question by voice. Um, so if you want to do this, we'll, we'll allow you to unmute um, so you can ask your question. Any technical issues should also go to the questions host. We have closed captions built into Zoom um, and you can use the CC button at the bottom of your screen to show or hide them. Um, so if you uh, hide them for yourself, it won't hide them for the rest of, of, the, of the audience. Um, also remember to nominate all of your outstanding early career friends and colleagues um, using the form, which will be dropped in the chat very shortly. And also um, please fill in our weekly feedback form for demographic information. This is an anonymous optional, but very much encouraged. And you'll be able to find that in the chat window very shortly as well. Uh, so now um, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Sarah Kasovich. Um, so Sarah did her um, Bachelor's of Honours course in Geology at the University of Wollongong um, in Australia, followed by a PhD in Radiolarian Micropaleontology at the University of Queensland, also in Australia. Um, and Sarah has sailed um, on board the RV Droides Resolution for five IODP expeditions um, as a marine technician, and is currently the IODP man manager for um, the Australian New Zealand branch um, of IODP at the Australian National University in Australia. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Sarah for her talk. Hello. Thank you. I really appreciate that um, introduction. So I'll just share my screen. Two seconds. There we go. Bear with me. And I'll close all these. So I'm Dr. Sarah Kasovich. I'm the Science Program Manager for Australia and New Zealand's IEDP Consortium. Um, uh, the list of kind of logos what um, uh, are represented down the bottom. So I'm hosted at the Australian National University. I'm also this weird superstar of STEM from Science and Technology Australia, which is an official program that helps um, definitely researchers, people in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, uh, in women, ideally, um, to accelerate into the kind of public and media space. And we do a high level training. So um, hopefully a bit of that shows. Um, but yeah, have a look at that. Um, so my talk will be broken into two sections. So I'll first go through the paleo pathway, um, my paleo pathways to my current career. And then I'll go into the second half of my talk, which will be about tiny time capsules. So first, I want to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm currently sitting on Ngunnawal and Nunbri people's country. So I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and the globe. 
their connections to the land, sea, and community. I pay my respect to their elders, past and present and future. Oh, sorry, I have to move a little bar. Um, and I just put this map here because Australia has one of the oldest uh, civilizations uh, on the planet. And uh, it, the First Nations represent about 65,000 years of um, kind of custodianship of Australia. And for this map here represents what Australia actually looked like for most of humankind. Uh, the First Nations saw about 13 volcanic eruptions. The sea level was a lot lower. So a lot of um, offshore archaeology is a big thing in Australia. And I just wanted to highlight that Western science is finally catching up to First Nations knowledge. And it's really exciting to see where this is going. Oh, no, my slides aren't working. So what does a science program manager do? So here are sort of four kind of facets of my job, and they're all sort of related to one another. So first is um, with my team, I monitor and control. So risks, priorities, deadlines, budgets of IADP, and with ANZAC, so Australia and New Zealand. I do a lot of communications. So engaging with stakeholders, conveying information from management to the science community and um, from grassroots upwards. Um, I evaluate the portfolio with my team, strategic planning of sets of projects, re uh, refine the operating models, support decisions. Um, and one of my favorite um, kind of part of my jobs is facilitating the science. That's mentoring and supporting the community, identifying and breakdown and barriers, and creating equitable opportunities. So if I could be a professional cheerleader, I think I found the right job. Um, but with all of this and sort of doing a bit of my uh, research as a side hustle on the side to keep going, um, I put this little quote here because I've got to remind myself all the time that time is sacred resource and unless it's managed, nothing else can be managed. So for those of you who don't know who um, BioDP is and what it is, um, IODP has been going for 55 years. And the current members are highlighted in dark blue here. So Australia and New Zealand are the only ones in the Southern Hemisphere right now, which is a bit sad. But previously, um, there has been more members. And when we sail around and drill in uh, kind of areas in other waters, we actually invite observers um, to scientists to actually come on and uh, participate as well. So it's truly an international collaboration. And what we do is we go out into the water and we do deep sea drilling. It's the only capability in the world and definitely at this uh, kind of coordination and we've made amazing discoveries over this time. So ANZIC, um, so those are the logos of the universities we sort of represent at ANZIC. Uh, my team is here. So there's the director, Ron Hackney there and Kelly Kenny, which is the admin officer from ANZIC. And ANZAC represents a consortium of 19 Australian New Zealand government agencies and universities. So I just want to pose this, uh, where has IADP collected core? Um, before I show you this new map, um, it's because it's with a spillhouse map projection, most people don't, aren't familiar with it. I just wanted to um, demonstrate that anytime you put a 3D image on a 2D surface, you're going to get warping and you're going to get um, a different story. So just to, most people are familiar with the Metcar um, projection. Um, so I just wanted to, the globe is three-dimensional. Um, imagine my head, it's also three-dimensional. If you put that on a 2D surface, it looks a bit like this. Um, and so you can sort of see that this very familiar map looks absolutely ridiculous when you put something else like a, a head onto a 3D image. So you can see how big my neck is stretched where Antarctica and sort of my forehead stretched in Greenland. And sort of the areas in the middle are a bit warped and small and it's just not quite right. So it, there's always a problem with putting a 3D to a 2D image. So going back to that question of where have we collected core, um, this is a spillhouse map projection. So, and with this, it's put the oceans at the center of um, the map. So again, there's some slight warping, but it's just a different perspective. And I like this one because Antarctica is here, Australia and New Zealand. This is the Pacific Ocean, Indian, Atlantic Ocean, and Arctic up here. It puts, it really demonstrates the kind of major ocean currents and how Antarctica is at the heart of the oceans. And that it's all connected. There's only one ocean that's connected across planetary scales, sort of the way um, plankton see the world. So um, all the yellow dots are where IODP has drilled before. That's over 460 kilometers of core. Um, there's a bit of a 
uh, sampling and preservational bias for the younger stuff, but we have collected many sites, um, multiple holes per sites into older material. The blue um, dots are proposed sites for the future. So just to give you a little flavor of all across the world kind of drilling. Um, so how did I get here? So my reflection on my career path. Um, so uh, one second. <laughs> Oh, my cats are being naughty. Um, so reflection on my career path. So before and after. So I went from being this person that absolutely, this little kid here that absolutely hated the world, the water, the ocean. I used to get so motion sick. I still do, but I've really overcome it. And now I'm this person on the right that absolutely adores it. I've learned how to manage um, my sickness out at sea and just really love it. Um, I think my mom's actually on the on the Zoom call as well. And I think uh, she, I think they all laughed when I started this career in kind of marine science because of how I grew up, hating kind of being on the ocean. Nope, my slides aren't working. And what really changed that, it was ideally being on the Geordie's resolution. I had the opportunity as a PhD student to sail as a scientist, as a radiolarist. And I really, anyone who sailed sort of have experienced this, I hope. It's really the friend machine out there. You're out there for two months at a time, uh, working seven days a week, 12 hour shift, shifts, no day off. And you're all in the same boat. Uh, and um, yeah, this just highlights some of the photos of that time pretty much on the Geordie's resolution that really changed my heart set and really made me fall in love with the IADP. So how did I find micropaleontology? I would say it was a very indirect path. Um, I started off in environmental science and sort of got poached by professors in my second year to geology um, at University of Wollongong. I started my PhD actually at Sydney University originally um, and I moved to Queensland and I actually started my PhD in igneous petrology on the Ladakh batholith up in the Himalayas and I did not touch a single igneous rock. Um, it was very quick that I was part of these Ophiolite teams and they just needed someone to do radiolarian work and I had done some before so um, I started to go along that path and as we'll explain in a bit this whole time I've sort of gone up and around and sort of found my way of um, where I am today. So after my PhD I did a uh, all in radiolarians um, there was an opportunity to be a technician um, and I just went for it because I really needed the money um, quite fast um, and it was just a great opportunity to upskill. So being a technician on the Geordie's resolution for five more expeditions was absolutely fantastic. I got to learn all these uh, kind of professional skills like firefighting, hazmat, um, all the first aid stuff. Um, I got to be an x-ray technician and imaging specialist as a micropaleontologist. They gave me a really high level training for microscopy and understanding actually taking microscopes apart and really understanding the, the technology there. I did learn some useless skills like uh, I can speed right upside down. I think most technicians can do that on the Geordie's resolution. I don't think it's a transferable skill. Um, and something else I really love is I got to see a lot of rocks and a lot of core and a lot of fossils. Um, this was really exciting to be so exposed to so many cool people, amazing people in their field and the really cool science. Um, another upskilling thing I got was I would never done professional photography before. I've only ever had my camera, um, but they took a chance on me and made me the imaging specialist. So I've absolutely fallen in love with this hobby. And they gave me the opportunity to take photos and to capture these amazing moments on the IODP expeditions and this is now part of my kind of identity and personality is to take photos with a professional camera these days so I'm very happy for this skill. Um, sort of how did I start to move from just being a technician into my current role? I guess it sort of started at the kind of COVID outbreak. Um, no scientists were able to sail during 2020-21 so the technicians had to really step up, all the JRSO staff and the Seam Offshore staff had to step up and actually still get core and still operate. Um, and so this gave me a huge opportunity to actually step up into a few roles and wear a few more hats and actually um, participate and engage more in that those kind of higher level decisions. Um, I like this photo here. It hasn't really been socialized, but this is uh, the photo of the Geordie's resolution right when um, the pandemic struck and there was hundreds of ships um, stuck at Panama port. Um, and again, one of the 
I, I really love communications now. And I really discovered this during the COVID period that I was able to take over the comms officer position and do a lot of the tweets. And I saw the high impact of getting the um, information out during this time, um, definitely to the scientists who weren't able to sail and, but were part of this expedition. My other motivators um, to shift careers was a huge one was Professor Leanne Amon, who sadly passed away, uh, oh gosh, a year ago now uh, in January. Um, she used to be the director of ANZIC, and she was the first and still only female director of any nation of IODP in the 55 years history. Hugely influential and very supportive of many people's careers. She was a diatom radiolarist, and it was very moving. Um, to me, when I heard about her diagnosis of cancer and she was doing a call for help for IODP, um, for ANZIC, I, I knew I had to step up and sort of help fill in. Um, another motivator was uh, about nine months before that call for this position came up um, was the IODP town hall meeting in AGU. It was all virtual in 2020. And that was when uh, Terry Quinn from uh, NSF actually did sort of the first announcement of the uncertainties of IDP's future, or at least the US's future post 2024. And it really gave me a gut feeling that um, I needed to sort of step up, I wanted to make a difference and help fight for IDP. So I put this here that I didn't set out to be a leader. And it wasn't about the role, I set out to make a difference. Okay, so let me just check the time. Oh. Oh, I didn't press play. Um, so um, I'll go into the research side of things now. So I will talk about my kind of my passion, sort of what I did my PhD and sort of what have I sort of carried on and what I hope to continue to carry on in the radiolarian space and in the paleontology space. So for those of you who don't know um, radiolarians, they are single celled organisms that have glass skeletons. They've existed for half a billion years. So they're absolutely amazing. They're very resistant in the fossil record. Um, I specialize in getting them out of chert. So even though I do work on IODP stuff, my passion actually is in Paleozoic. Um, and they have a rapid evolution, as you saw from that little um, GIF that I showed you from Expedition 362 I collected. Um, but there's many different forms and it makes it um, a very good biostratigraphical tool. And my disclosure that radiolarians do not actually exist in nutshells. Um, another image that I took uh, actually during COVID, um, if anyone wants to know that the expedition codes, if you ever see IODP and it has like a number with a C at the end, that actually represents a COVID expedition. Um, so this one here has a one millimeter scale and you can see sort of how small radiolarians actually are. Um, so forearms are a little bit bigger. Um, radiolarians are zooplankton, so they are animal-like, so sort of like the forearms. And I just put the coccolithophores there, but I won't go into them. So tracking the timing of events in Earth's history. So I'm actually more of an applied biostratigrapher and I also work on the biostratigraphy methods. Um, so this is a quick pitch for the Micropaleontology um, Society. They do have their um, calendar competition open. I've been lucky enough to win twice. So I do recommend if you have any beautiful photos of radiolarians or other fossil groups, please submit. Even artworks are welcome. So this one won actually for, uh, uh, they won last, this photo won last year, but it's in this year's calendar. So kind of clocks in the rocks. Um, is sort of what I what we do. Um, and again, the different forms um, come from different times and we do track the timing of events in history with these different fossils. So um, biostratigraphy helps um, the chronological framework um, and it enables us to make informed interpretations and forecast about Earth's past, present and future. So I really wanna know pretty much anything from climate change to natural hazards, evolution of life, plate tectonics, uh, energy crisis and sound construction. I wanna know how fast, how often, and are events related? And this often means that I'm actually an accessory scientist to a large group. I rely on other fields to sort of understand the parameters. And I just put that, um, I just time travel for them and I put that constraint on those big projects for them. So here, um, 
these images, if you see these 3D uh, models, uh, it's absolutely fantastic feature in PowerPoint. If you've never discovered it, you can just go on Sketchfab or Thingiverse. You can download um, 3D models and import 3D models and actually manipulate them in uh, PowerPoint now. So this is a uh, radiolarian, and I'll just go back and forward again just so you can see it. As this radiolarian turns around, it really demonstrates how three-dimensional it is. Um, and it depends on what angle you're actually looking at this uh, radiolarian on, on what you're actually seeing and if you can even identify it and describe it. You could probably describe it many ways on what kind of orientation. So I've put from Zhang's um, and Suzuki's uh, paper here that this is this exact species, the tetrapile, that made just changes in appearances of the species in different orientations is very common. So that's one of our problems, why we need to do three-dimensional scanning. Um, the other problem is a lot of identification um, requires us to see the internal features, definitely for bias stratigraphy. So this here I collected on 362. Um, it was probably my favorite, it's my poster boy, um, my favorite radiolarian of all times, but it took me two years to build up the courage to break the skeleton and actually identify the family. <laughs> of this radiolarian. I was expecting multiple spheres, but as soon as I did that, um, I was pleasantly surprised um, when I put it under the SEM to see it's a beautiful array and internal spicule. So it is what's inside that counts. Um, and sometimes that's really hard, definitely if you go through diagenically matured sediments and you can't see through the rad. Definitely for, this is more for Mesozoic and Paleozoic rads. Sometimes Eocene, um, Paleocene guys, um, get um, diagenically matured too, but if we use light microscope, we can generally observe that and actually make the correct identification. So we do this as well for our cone-shaped radiolarians. These are narcillarians. Uh, so we can see these models and, but narcillarians are a little bit easier. Um, this little feature in here is the internal spicule. So we can either look up that kind of skirt there, or if we go back because it's so close to the external feature, is that's actually impinging on the kind of top catchable there. So anyone who doesn't know radiolarian by stratigraphy, sort of the most important thing, at least for these cone-shaped guys, um, to help identify them, you actually look at this little um, feature here, the Kefalos. So 3D imaging uh, isn't as necessary for the Narcillarian guys, but definitely for the spherical forms, the Spomolarians, the Intactinarians. Okay, so let's go forward. So my PhD actually was mostly to do with the Newfoundland material. Um, there was a new lattice stratum that I discovered in the Piccadilly Quarry, and this was Paleozoic age, so uh, Dewillian. Um, and I had an unfortunate event that I picked all these amazing radiolarians, about 401 SEM stub, but I was using cardboard um, SEM stub holders, uh, uh, cartons. And because they were cardboard, it rolled and crushed them all. I cried, but I put them in the SEM and then I cried again because it actually revealed an unexpected diversity. And from that, we actually wrote an IELC grant and we did, started to do a whole micro CT scanning on these radiolarians. And it sort of branched off into two more PhDs after me. So it's very exciting. So if you look at the green kind of features in these spherical radiolarians, if you imagine they were full, um, you can see that they're very diverse and very different. There's multiple spheres, there's elaborate spicules, or there's no spheres inside. Um, all the spicules are on the outside. Um, so even though we had this amazing diversity, I still had to rely on things like conodonts to get my age constraints. So there is a lot of work to be done in the Paleozoic. I think with technology improvements, we can actually establish a really sound biostratigraphy for Paleozoic um, work. Um, so this is uh, a bit of the results from the micro CT work. So you can see absolutely amazing stuff here. So this is just one radiolarian and you could pretty much write a whole thesis on one scan. The amount of information is there. Um, so you can pull out multiple spheres. Um, this here, this microsphere was the first time ever seeing this uh, in science. Uh, we've never seen it before. Um, it was really fan fantastic to study it and to see actually how it formed and how it implemented the impacted the external features. Um, so how do we get this? We mounted them up um, just very quickly on a little, very carefully on a little slide. Um, we put it into an X-ray um, 
micro CT machine first, um, and ideally just like a CAT scan at a hospital. Um, very similar. Uh, you just take multiple images around uh, around the specimen and stitch them together. The only difference is is the specimen rotates, whereas when you're getting a CAT scan at the hospital, the instrument rotates around you. So understanding uh, this is some of the results, um, they're very exciting. So this was published in uh, scientific reports in 2019. So this shows you that we could start understanding the specular system. We could insert a, a, a sphere to actually see and maybe make inferences on how that actual radiolarian grew from the main spicules and grew out to those smaller little features. That's that guy there, or how they're actually related to sort of one another or convergent evolution just started to truly understand and study the morphology of radiolarians through time. So here are just a few more just to touch base. Um, how much time do I have left? Sorry, my timer didn't go. Um, uh, you have lots of time left, don't worry. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, so you can see here, here's another um, kind of demonstrates that there's the same spicule feature in green in all these species, they're all to scale um, to one another. And you can see they're very different forms, but yet they have that same kind of potentially convergent evolution, potentially uh, a related somehow. We just don't know. We need our biologist on this case, but uh, again, we're making our first steps. Um, we also have very complex specular systems um, to involve. So you can imagine with all the a single cell there with all the organelles in there, how, how squishy it could be. Um, this part here, so uh, my PhD led into Sumini's PhD, so she did amazing work on uh, many formations. This one's from the Pinglian formation in China. Um, she did, again, all division, but late all division, and she discovered whole new genres of species of, of radiolarians and really started to understand that architecture in a kind of three-dimensional space, because they are very three-dimensional um, organisms. Um, sort of my last kind of project, what I'm kind of working on now in my kind of spare time is helping Johnny Shang um, with her PhD. Ooh, let's just put them all up there. Um, so she's doing amazing work at the University of Queensland. So what we've sort of identified is oil shales. Uh, we've always known that radiolarians had been in oil shales with a silicate component um, to make it brittle. But it's always been noted that they're too poorly preserved to be studied. A lot of the times they've actually been dissolved away, pyrotized, calcified. Um, they're just almost impossible to digest out. Um, so here we can see thin sections and you can sort of see that the radiolarians are so beautifully preserved, but it's still a bit hard to identify if you're not seeing them in three dimensions. But what you see here is actually the black is empty space or bitumen in there. So it's actually the ghost of the radiolarian. So last year, we actually went down to the new micro CT beam line in the Australian synchrotron. Uh, I think we were the fourth project on there and we put a little micro core, which was only three millimeters across in this oil shale into the CT. And we sort of wanted to, we did this because we feel like we need to understand oil shales better to understand uh, this little window into Earth's geological history, kind of really around kind of the tipping points and in Earth's history and mass extinctions. Um, how does climate change uh, affect uh, hypoxia conditions or growing dead zones? Uh, can we understand some of the trade offs, definitely dead zones and hypoxia, for some of the most popular climate solutions? So, oh, spelling mistake, accelerating Earth's processes. So um, that's sort of referring to if we fertilize the oceans, we're gonna create algae blooms, but those algae blooms will draw all the carbon out, but it will create um, a lot more hypoxia events below. And do we actually understand the full trade-offs and how the ecosystem responds on top of the water column and below um, during these kind of events? So that's sort of the motivator for this project. And I'm not gonna show too many results because it's still in preparation, but it was very amazing. You can see this is a 400 million year old ghost. So this radiolarian does not exist. Uh, you can see three spheres. Um, it's actually hollow and filled with bitumen. Um, this is actually in situ as well. So we've never really done in situ scanning of radiolarians and we saw a diversity, hopefully a full assemblage analysis 
of that in three dimensions. Um, so lots of different forms. There's some sort of associations with some forms with others. So maybe there's some clusters when they died. Again, we did a very small micro um, mini core. Um, yeah, so we hopefully we can get this paper out soon. But um, yeah, it's very exciting, uh, very revolutionary, I think, to see things this way and actually observe fossils that have traditionally not been able to be studied before. Definitely the micro fossils. So exciting future work for radiolarians, in my opinion, is a lot more micro CT analysis. I don't think we need a CT scan every single fossil, micro fossil out there. I do think we need to scan holotypes. Every time I ask a museum or a kind of repository for a Paleozoic radiolarian um, for a holotype, a lot of the times they go to check and it's been destroyed. It's been flipped over, or it's pulverized, or it's lost. Uh, a lot of uh, museums are understaffed and there's maybe a macro paleontologist, someone who does dinosaurs, looking after the micro paleontology collection. And it's really devastating to see these holotypes destroyed and potentially lost forever. So I think it's very important to preservation of this knowledge is to get these digitized. Um, it's really hard to transport kind of micro fossils around the world to study and compare and um, see these um, in different lights to what you're seeing. Um, so I think just transferring the digital files is just so much easier. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can actually reclassify the taxonomy just with it, digital holotypes or paratypes, because as I mentioned, a lot of them are destroyed. Um, in situ scanning, I think this is going to be huge. Um, I'm very excited for Johnny's PhD to be finished because it's absolutely revolutionary. I think a full assemblage analysis, we can assess preservational biases and digestion biases in our methods. Um, and yeah, we can answer new questions with these technologies, which is very exciting. The other part is biology. It's really coming along really fast. Um, there's some great people doing some amazing work with the RNA stuff. With the radiolarians, uh, they're redefining our concepts of species, taxonomy, theories of evolution, and um, even the life cycles. We still haven't actually cultivated a radiolarian, a full life cycle of a radiolarian in a lab yet. I don't know how they've existed for half a billion years if they're that picky about um, surviving in kind of difficult conditions, but uh, maybe that's Maybe that's something to note that maybe they are a good species to actually indicate different environmental changes because they are so um, difficult to cultivate in a lab environment. Um, but yeah, lots of work happening there. Um, very fast and very exciting stuff. And hopefully it's all related to biology, the CT kind of understanding kind of the natural taxonomy with the kind of morphology at this higher level. So I'm really excited to see Radiolarians, foraminifera, all these fossil groups actually accelerate their um, their fields and their applications because of advancements in technology. So I'll end there. Um, so thank you for listening to my talk. Um, again, I'll stay on for some questions. Um, yeah, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thank you so much for such an awesome talk. I, I love the end slide, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. This was for the future deep workshop, the future drilling to explore us past. So I made this for um, our Hobart workshop this year. Super cool. Um, Thank you. So just a reminder to the audience, you can send your questions into the questions at PaleoPerks host um, by the chat, or you can raise your hand um, and we'll unmute you. Um, so you can ask your question by voice. Um, so we've had a few questions in um, already. Um, so one that we have in. Um, so I'll pop these into the chat. Um, so we've got them on as well. Um, so this is from Kay Sender Salon, and uh, Sender asks, is the biological age at the time of preservation biostratigraphically significant um, for identifying the timing of heterochrony and other evolutionary processes within radiolarians? Yeah, I, a few facets to that question. Um, the first one is definitely through time. Uh, before diatoms, they only sort of evolved and came into the fossil record about 150 million years ago. So radiolarians as the silica group, they used to be a lot more. They're, I don't think their diversity got affected, but the competition for silica definitely impacted that. So definitely through times when the diatoms came in, we do see a thinning of shells, so that does impact their preservation. Um, sorry, I gotta read the question again. 
significant. Um, yeah, and I guess different times during the Earth's history, um, sedimentation was a little different. So preservation um, will affect um, different types, different ages. Um, definitely if we have mass extinctions in the Permian, lots of oil shales, we're going to have poorer preserved radiolarians a lot in these um, materials. So we do have gaps in the biostratigraphy. Um, so hopefully we can now infill that um, knowledge in our kind of models and taxonomy and bridge those some um, species. The second part of the question is, sorry, <laughs> it's getting late. Yeah, so this is a difficult question right now. So the I don't think there's many biologists on here right now. I'm not a biologist. And I think I, I completely acknowledge that the current taxonomy, I think this is actually for most microfossil groups, um, especially is they don't represent a true taxonomy. What is biostratigraphically important isn't always um, fits a natural taxonomy. Sometimes say in the Devonian, we see a twisting in their spine and that actually is more of an environmental issue, uh, environmental impact, um, but we actually see that in a set interval. So we can actually date that to a time if we're seeing a mass kind of twisting in a bladed spine. We know that, um, yeah, sometimes we do use morphotypes to, we do completely recognize it's not this, a different species, but a, a certain morphotype came in at a certain time and we actually use that as a biostratigraphy age. Did that answer the question? I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I guess if there's, there's, there's follow-ups, they'll, they'll follow um, in yeah. the chat. Um, so we have, uh, hang on, so we've had a follow-up. So uh, the so sender has said, um, uh, I meant like biologically younger specimens, so juveniles and sub-adults and adults. Mm. Yeah, this is again hard because we've never really observed them in a full life cycle in the laboratory. So again, I think some some species, some juveniles have been noted as a as a species, a separate species to the adult species. Um, there's a lot of work to comb through. I am actually a clumper, not a splitter. Uh, yeah, I'm a clumper, not a splitter in the paleontology world. So I would argue that um, yes, it has significantly impacted kind of the biostratigraphy. We need more radiolarist. There's not enough of us. <laughs> oh, um, so we have a um, question that's a bit more career specific. Um, so was there a specific reason that you gravitated towards radiolarians and not some other group when you transitioned into paleontology slash started your PhD? Yeah, I honestly, it was completely coincidental and I'm very happy and I absolutely in love with the radiolarians. I definitely as an artist, I, I think that the most beautiful macro fossil group, sorry guys, I don't care what you think, the most beautiful fossil group out there. Um, it just so happened to be that my PH, my honors supervisor in my undergraduate, he had just a project on some radiolarians. I thought it was cool. Let's try it out. And then he sort of handed me over to my PhD advisor who had done radiolarian, uh, Jonathan Atchison, who done radiolarian biostratigraphy in the past. And even though I was going to start in a different field because I had those radiolarian skills and worked with HF already before, and we just came across charts in the Ophiolite um, and there was no one to do them. So I think I just sort of fell backwards, but I, it took me a long time to realize I really love this. And I'm very grateful that uh, even though it took me a while to realize that radiolarians were great. Um, yeah, I think they still have a huge potential. I think a lot of fossil groups, even the ones that are, don't have enough um, people working on them, still have a lot of potential as well. But um, yeah, we just got to work through this um, dying fields and how can we accelerate and make it more accessible and definitely applied biostratigraphy. How can we make it um, so you don't have to have a PhD under your belt to actually do applied biostratigraphy for our fields? Thanks. Um, I'm also a big fan of radiolarians. They're very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have another question. Um, so you mentioned that your current position entails several different roles slash tasks. 
Is there a certain part of your current position that you especially enjoy? Was that from my boss? No. <laughs> um, yeah, again, it's the helping the community communicating. Obviously, I, I really love that. But it's really, I, I think I've lived very recently. I'm still in ECR. And I've seen IADP from a different side um, to the most of the management. So I'm really excited to be in and hopefully bridging my experience and my recent experiences with the management and bringing it, um, trying to translate kind of those experiences, those problems or um, great stuff and kind of my barriers I had and how can I break down those barriers? And of course, if I had those barriers, other people would have had those barriers, definitely as an ECR. So I, I really like those problems. I, I dream about my work, so I'm always working. So um, my husband's nodding. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I really just love the people aspect. Um, I actually nearly didn't even get into science out of my high school because I thought science was all about things, not people. So I'm really glad I, I sort of fell backwards even into science, so to say. Yeah. And definitely relate with a lot of what you mentioned. <laughs> People's side of science is definitely very, very important. Um, I don't think it gets socialized enough, but this is what a scientist actually is. It's it's no longer you don't write papers by yourself. It's all collaboration. Mm -hmm. My my science, my applied biostratigraphy is pretty. It's data reports. If I don't have other scientists with me, like I can interpret some stuff, but to really make it significant, I do rely on um, kind of a collaboration to make my work really impactful and making it um, relevant to society. collaboration aspect is, is, is definitely an important one that we do we don't compete we we collaborate with each other exactly yeah. and definitely the radiolaris because there's not enough of us I think I've been sitting on research for five years I'm, I'm not going to get scooped so <laughs> for some stuff um, so we have uh, one radiolarian question that has also come in um also from Sandra um and Sandra asks will two radiolarians with similar internal architecture slash specular arrangements have similar external structures? Yes, um, sometimes we see this. We actually see convergent evolution crazily with the radiolarians. I don't know with the other fossil groups, maybe with um, forums, I'm thinking. But uh, radiolarians, the spherical form, I think, is the perfect form. Uh, we just keep seeing it come back. And actually, if you look at some modern species, they look just like the Paleozoic stuff, but you do have to crack it open. And there's some clues there about the morphology. Sometimes it's almost impossible, but we do know it's actually a completely different family um, and order sometimes. And convergent evolution really, um, it's, it's difficult to use. And I think this is our biggest hurdle to come over, whereas... Um, how do you train this for someone to just pick up a rock and look at that and not make inferences from the other fossils that are there and other fossil groups? Um, yeah, a lot of the times what we're seeing right now is actually there is such a diversity. Um, with every sample, you're getting like thousands of species and morphotypes. Um, they look so different at times to one another, but that internal feature is very similar for some of them. And it's yeah, I think we're just trying to figure out, uh, definitely with our biologist, what is true and um, what can we use for biostratigraphy and what can we actually use to actually understand evolution, maybe even challenge some of the evolutionary theories. Um, I think in radiolarians, just to go back to that question before, um, uh, what we sort of see with radiolarians is there's no survival really of the fittest, like diatoms came around and started eating all the silica competing and the species didn't really get affected, they just thinned their skeletons a bit. But the, the, there was no mass dying when diatoms came about. Um, and we do see in mass extinctions, turnovers of species, but there's always extinctions happening in radiolarians. And it's really fascinating that it's actually a lot of the times they make themselves go extinct. Um, so the most beautiful radiolarians at times are actually the end of an evolutionary line. Um, so you see these absolutely beautiful radiolarians and what happens, it just seems to be playing around with the, the patterns, the kind of the blueprints of what is possible 
until it actually constrains on the maybe the nucleus because it's an internal skeleton gets too tight it seems to be really small and very elaborate and that's sort of the end of that kind of line is sort of what we see a lot um yeah maybe that's something to also study is uh kind of radiation as well um, how fast radiolarins start to um kind of evolve um, this is something we've sort of been thinking about since 2016. We haven't had enough people or kind of time to look at this, but uh, we just confirmed that sexual reproduction does happen in radiolarians. We weren't able to reproduce, but we saw a radiolarian actually export um, sexual uh, gametes out of a skeleton. So we see conjoint twins in the fossil record. So we know asexual reproduction happens. So not much evolution when you have um, cloning going on, but when you have sexual reproduction, potentially there's an acceleration. So we actually think we've never seen a clone happen in the lab, but we've seen this sexual reproduction. Maybe it was because it was under stress and we can't actually handle uh, radiolarians properly in the lab. So maybe there we're seeing in the environment too, um, if there's stress, like an environmental stress all of a sudden, maybe radiolarians convert to sexual reproduction and there's an, a radiation of... Um, Evolution, maybe that's something we've got to look for, not just extinctions, is um, rates of evolution. Um, all questions, please, someone say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that was a tangent. <laughs> Good tangent. All oh, good. Um, so we have one question um, in from Nadia Azar. Um, Nadia asks, is a postgrad degree required to be a micropaleontologist on IODP expeditions? And are there many places, positions that micropaleontologists can go into? Yeah, um, I guess for IADP, generally, the there are some opportunities for undergraduates to go out onto the ship, but it's more of the training level, not really at the research level. Um, there's been many master students, um, lots of PhD students actually sail on IADP expeditions. So yes, uh, at least a master's. Um, would get you out on an IADP expedition. Um, yeah, um, to be a micropaleontologist, no, you can only, you don't need to be just that. And the IADP material is housed in core repositories, which are open to anyone. So even if you wanna work on past IADP material, it's actually free. You can go to the repository or you can request, they'll send it for free to you. Um, feel free to reach out if you have some ideas or you want to have a look at some stuff for education as well as research. Um, if you have a question, you can just send it, make a micropaleontologist. If you're not doing CT analysis or DNA stuff, we're actually quite soft money. So as long as you have a microscope and you can do some sediment work and picking, um, it's quite low money. Um, and again, it's quite nice projects. So that part is at least accessible to um, anyone and definitely undergrads. Uh, are there many places micropaleontologists can go. A lot of micropaleontologists go to museums, <laughs> I find. Um, there's oil industry, um, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, there's, yeah, construction too. You gotta, if you wanna build a tunnel and you gotta follow a formation, some people follow the forearms um, in the formation. Uh, geochemistry, so uh, that's more into the research aspect. Um, but museums do like, uh, we need people to almost be stamp collectors at time. I think a lot of us have a little heart for stamp collecting uh, to find the species just documented and that's it. It's just, uh, we don't know where it fits, how it fits. It's just a mis miscellaneous, we're just making an observation. Um, we do need a lot more of that in micropaleontology and I think that's the best place to do in a museum. Um, yeah, it depends what you want out of micropaleontology. Do you want to be out in the field, in the lab? Um, if you do want to be working on big science or do you just want to be working with the fossils themselves? Yeah, good question. Thanks. Um, uh, we have another crazy question. Um, so what does the strategic planning side of your role involve and what skills do you use from your scientific training to help you undertake those activities? I don't feel like I've been trained for my current role, but I think that's most people. I think that's even in the academic, pure academia stream when you get thrown into teaching. Uh, I don't think none of us really get trained to be teachers or lecturers um, or even to do public talks. Um, 
so I feel like that's a very common feeling is that we're not quite trained, um, but you acknowledge what you can't do and you just want to develop and you never compare yourself to someone else, only your former self. So be real with yourself, what you can and can't do and just sort of make plans to sort of how can you do your role? And because if you can't do your role, you're going to feel like it's personally you, but really it might just be, you need some straight, your kind of professional development. Uh, the strategic planning side. So uh, again, with the office, we manage the big budgets. We sort of help uh, with me. I definitely look after the science committee and I help. They're my dreamers of IODP and ANZAC. So just sort of helping them develop their ideas, making sure sometimes they're not too ambitious or they are prioritizing the right things, making sure they're aware of certain things and just helping them communicate back to our governing council. And again, just communicating to the governing council and sort of working with the director definitely about and uh, the admin about uh, kind of the strategic decisions around finances, around is everything equitable and fair? Are we treating everyone? Are we looking at the broader picture? So it's very different from project management. It's program management that I really look at. Um, and what skills? I I think um, I think. I, me, I, I'm doing my own thing here. I, as you can see, I put a lot of art into everything I do in my communications. So I like to photography, art. I'm a visual communicator. So those are the big skills I've definitely transferred from my micropaleontology kind of background into strategic planning. Um, I know that an image speaks a thousand words. So sometimes to really convey a message, it's like it's not a fossil. Sometimes it is a diagram or an image, just like the one you're seeing here. Um, from my scientific training, uh, I, I was able to manage sort of the lab as a PhD student as well. So I got a little bit of leadership there. I was quite broke in my PhD, so I had to do a lot of uh, uh, TA working and helping lecture. Um, so I got a lot of those skills as well from that time, um, even though I had a different motive to do it. Um, it's all skills I've actually used. Yeah, and strategic planning, uh, I guess with micropaleontology, we're really good with Excel sheets and uh, we have to be on top of our fossils and our rocks and making sure that we don't misplace certain rocks. So that sort of fits into the ro uh, role as well is sort of how do we manage many things and how do we stay on top of projects? And instead of fossils, I do um, projects, yeah. Cool. Um, so um we have one more question um, this will be the final question before we close out um so another one from um from sander can the specific niche that radiolarians occupy be a possible reason for the extreme convergence observed in some radiolarians yeah i think so I think uh, the planktonic form, that kind of sphere, um, is possible for that reason, for that convergent evolution. I, it's really hard to say because, again, I haven't actually been out there. I only look at them when they're dead. I never look at them when they're alive. Um, when I do see them alive, um, there's some great stuff on Twitter about living radiolarians, definitely by John Deco. Um, some cast giant nets so it's also I've never really thought about how they actually function in the, the streams of the water the Narcillarians don't actually sit like that in the water column they actually sit like that against the water column so the little cone-shaped guys are actually on their side and they cast nets out and bring them so I feel like the cone-shaped Narcillarian order actually has once it actually designed that kind of form, it's actually really taken off and it's actually a very successful um, order of radiolarians. So I think once it found that, that's that's um, keeps converting back to that kind of meth, uh, that mode of radiolarians. The sphere, again, I think it's just equal pressure, I suppose. There are theories that maybe they operate just like Ancantharians, definitely when they reproduce, uh, sexually at least, is that when they're getting ready, um, they start absorbing their one cell into the gametes, they actually sink down the water column and where it's safer, where there's less um, predation, and they actually completely dissolve the whole organ uh, out into gametes to help reproduce, to actually help for a fighting chance. 
So that sphere might just be a better delivery for that kind of mode. No, that might be a survival of the fittest. Um, I think it's a bit of luck, but I think it's just, I think it's the perfect plan, the, the blueprint for a fossil, for a, for a plankton. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that answered it. I don't think we have a an answer for that. So yeah, it's definitely a, something to keep discussing. Um, so uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, if there are any last questions, um, please send them in. Um, okay, looks like that was that was the final question. Um. So I'm going to take back the screen share from you. Um, so thank you so much um, again to Sarah for such an awesome, awesome talk. Um, it was really awesome to hear about your um, career pathway and, and more about your radio learning science as well. Um, and thank you very much to everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, so please remember to fill out the weekly feedback form. The link will be in the chat very shortly so that we can learn a bit more about who attended today's seminar. We're on hiatus next week, um, which is Tuesday, July 18th, but we'll be back with Paleo Pathways um, on July 25th um, at um, 3 p.m. UTC. Um, and next week, uh, sorry, in, in two weeks' time, um, at Paleo Pathways will be joined by Rhea Mitchell um, from the UK, who will be talking a bit more about careers in microscopy applications development. Um, and um, we have um, tea time coming up. Um, so this um, it's an informal conversation about the talk in a relaxed setting. And our question of the week um, is, would you consider a hybrid career in academia? Um, but now it's uh, time for a break before tea time. Um, so remember to get up, walk around, have a quick drink of water, come back in two minutes. And if you have um, paleo pets, we, we love to meet them. Um, so remember to bring them as well. Um, but we'll see you very shortly. Thank you.